My name is Rick Renner, and I'm in the lower district of ancient Pergamum in what today is called the Red Hall or the Red Court because of the red bricks that are used in this building. But 2,000 years ago, this very building was the Temple of Isis and Serapis, which is an Egyptian religion. There were a lot of Egyptians in Asia, and a lot of them lived here in the city of Pergamum. A lot of commerce between Egypt and Asia, and the Egyptians congregated in these big, important Asian cities. And this was one of the big temples where they worship, the Temple of Isis and Serapis. Believers would not enter into places like this in the first century because they had been delivered from this. How about you? Think of all the things you've been delivered from that you don't want to revisit in your life. If you've been delivered from alcohol and delivered from fornicating and delivered from a lifestyle of sin, you don't want to go back to that. Well, likewise, the believers have been delivered from all of this and they didn't want to come back into these places again. They shunned these pagan temples. But there was a group called the Nicolaitans. And these Nicolaitans were in Ephesus and they were in Pergamum. And the Nicolaitans were a group of teachers who said, now wait a minute, we don't need to be so strict and so separated. These pagans are good people. They're not so bad. We need to spend time with them. We need to go with them to their temples. We need to befriend them. And then maybe we can win them to Christ. And really the Nicolaitans were condoning compromise. Jesus was so against this that in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, Jesus said he was against the deeds of the Nicolaitans. In Revelation 2 verse 15, he said he was against the doctrines of the Nicolaitans. And in both of those verses, the Bible actually uses the word hate, the Greek word misio, which describes a repugnance for something, something that is absolutely revolting and disgusting. Jesus really says, this idea of compromise is disgusting. It's revolting and I reject it. If that's the opinion of Jesus, it ought to be our opinion too. But we need to know what is the doctrine of the Nicolaitans in the world today? How do you recognize the current doctrine of Nicolaitans? What does it look like? What does it sound like? And what do we do when we confront it? That's what I'm gonna to talk to you about today. Stay tuned for a teaching you can trust, a message that will inspire strengthen and equip you with vital insight and understanding from the Word of God. Here's Rick. Have you been waiting for me? I've been waiting for you. And today we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 2 and today we're going to really focus on verse 6 where Jesus talks about a group whom he calls the Nicolaitans. Who are the Nicolaitans and who are the Nicolaitans in the world today? Wow, that's going to be very important. But I want to remind you that I'm offering you my series, Christ's Message to Ephesus, and today is the last day we're giving you this special offer. It's a 10-part series based on these programs, and it comes with a study guide just filled with wonderful information. The Greek words, the definitions, the points, the principles, everything you've seen in these programs, but because it comes with a study guide, you can walk through the teaching with me. It'll be good for you personally to share with a friend that you're discipling, or even with a Bible study group. And we're also offering you today, for the last time on the program, my book called A Light in Darkness, Seven Messages to the Seven Churches. If you've not ordered this book, order it today. This is a fabulous book. Now, we're going to jump right back into Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1. I want us to re review very quickly. And beginning in verse 1, Christ is speaking to the church at Ephesus. But he doesn't speak directly to the church. He speaks to the angel of the church, that word angel, the Greek word angelos, it described the pastor or the overseer of the church. Christ never bypasses spiritual authority. If he has a message to speak to the church, especially a rebuke, the pastor's going to hear it first. And that's what we now find in Revelation chapter 2 in verse 1. It says, under the angel of the church of Ephesus. We understand that's the pastor. Right. These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, and who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We saw this word midst is the Greek word mesas. It means to be right in the very heart or to be right in the very gut of a thing. The word walketh is the Greek word peripatao. Peri means around. The word patao means to walk. When you put the two words together, we find that Christ was walking circles around the church, taking an exterior view. But because that was not enough, he actually came inside the church, and now he's in the midst. He's right in the heart. 
He is right in the very gut of the church. And in fact, this word walketh peripateo describes one who regularly or habitually walks in one place. Christ is in the church. He loves the church. He's walking in the church. It's where he is all the time. And because he was in the church, he was able to see everything about them. And that's why he says in verse 2, I know thy works. That word know, the Greek word oida, from a Greek root, which means to see or to behold, to know something from personal observation. So Jesus now says, because I'm walking in the midst of you, I've seen everything. In fact, it says, I know thy works. The word works, the Greek word erga, it describes their total activities, everything about them. There's nothing about you that has escaped me. I see it all. I know everything about you. I know it because of my own personal observation. And now Jesus gives the report of what he has seen. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and you found them to be liars. These are all commendations. Wow, they're a hardworking church, they're a patient church, they really love doctrinal purity. They try them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them to be liars, which means they don't quickly endorse people. First, they check them out to make sure they're authentic. Then when you come to verse 3, Jesus says, you didn't just do this in the beginning, but you've continued to do it and has born. The Greek says, you've always been responsible. You are still responsible and has patience. You've always been patient. You are still patient. And you've done it for my name's sake, this verse says. And then it uses the word labor. This word labor, the Greek word kopas, it is the most wearisome, hardest kind of labor. This was a hard-working church, and the verse says, and has not fainted. That word fainted really means to give in, to give out. But not this church. They didn't give in. They didn't give out. They have continually been responsible. They have continually been patient. They have continually been working, and they've done it all for Jesus' name. But yet when you come to verse 4, we find Jesus has a strike against them. That's literally what the Greek says. It says in verse 4, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. That word against, the Greek word kata, it describes a downward movement or a strike against. Jesus said, in spite of all the good things I've already recognized about you, here's something I've seen that's not good, and this is a strike against you. What is it? He says, because thou hast left thy first love. We've already seen the Greek structure is different. The Greek structure says, because you are love, the first one, you've let it slip through your fingers. He's referring to what they were like when they first came to Christ. Their first love, romantic love. You could even translate it early love. Maybe you remember when you first fell in love with your spouse. Early love. You were enthralled. You were captivated. You thought about your spouse all the time. It was early love. What wonderful memories. And now Jesus says to the church of Ephesus, that early love, those wonderful feelings, when your heart was enraptured with me, you've somehow let it slip through your fingers. The word left does not mean to abandon, really means to lose. Something just slipping through your fingers. You've lost your grip on this thing which was so precious. And now you've been reduced to a routine, a machinery, just trafficking in the things of ministry, still doing everything that is right, working hard, enduring, doing it all for my name's sake. You're doing, 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 but in the midst of all you're doing, you've lost that one element you had in the beginning that was so precious, and this is a strike against you. So Jesus tells them in verse 5 what to do. He says, remember. We've seen the word remember, the Greek word menea, which is the Greek word for a sepulcher or a tomb. Jesus was literally saying, those precious memories you had with me, who you used to be when you first came to Christ, all of that seems to have been buried under the clutter of years and years of activity. Now you need to go back to the beginning and remove all the dirt of all that activity and you need to resurrect those early memories you need to remember. And then he says, remember from whence. The word whence, the Greek word pothen, it points back to an earlier place, an earlier time. He's saying, go back to the very beginning and see what you were like when you first came to me, when you first repented. You can read about that in Acts chapter 19, where we find they were an inferno. They were burning with the fire of the Holy Ghost. And Jesus says, remember from whence thou art fallen. Fallen, 
being the Greek word pipto, but the tense that is used describes an already completed state. Jesus says, you know what? The church world says you're the biggest, you're the best, the most developed, but let me tell you what I see. You're not even in the process of falling. The Greek word means an already completed state. You have already completely fallen. Even though you're big, you have systems, you're developed, even though you seem so mature, if I compare you now to what you had in the beginning, you are completely fallen. And Jesus calls on them to repent. That's what we covered in the last program, the Greek word metanoeo. It describes a change of mind, has nothing to do with emotion. It may come with emotion, but emotions are not required for repentance. Jesus was telling them to make a decision to turn around, to go back to what they used to be. In fact, Jesus says, repent and do the first works. First works in Greek means do the things you did in the very beginning. Then he continues to say, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Twice in this verse, Christ calls on the church of Ephesus to repent. Now, right now, I'm offering this little book called Repentance, What It Is, What It Isn't, and How to Do It, because I know there's a lot of confusion today about the subject of repentance. Some people say Christians don't even need to repent, but Christ clearly told this church to repent. These were Christians that Christ was speaking to. Well, what is repentance? What is it? What it isn't? And how to do it? This is my gift to you for a very limited period of time, one per household. If you'll contact us, we'll get it right to you. I want as many people to have it as possible because I believe people need to understand the power of real, genuine repentance. But today we're going to continue to the next verse. And when we come to verse 6, Jesus says this. Now look at this. This is really something. But this thou hast. A better translation would be, but you do have this one thing really in your favor that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Well, the word hate is a very strong word. I remember when our sons were young, if they used the word hate, they got in trouble and they got in serious trouble because we did not allow the word hate in our house. But now Christ himself uses the word hate and in fact, he uses it in a very positive way. Look what verse six says. But this thou hast, or this one thing is in your favor, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans. Notice what he did not say. He did not say you hate the Nicolaitans. He didn't say that. Christ does not hate the Nicolaitans. The Ephesian church did not hate the Nicolaitans. We are not called to hate anybody. We're not even called to hate people that we disagree with. We can hate their deeds. We can hate their teaching. We can hate their influence. But we're not called to hate anybody. Now, the word hate that is used in this verse is the Greek word misio. Listen to what it means. To hate, to abhor, to find utterly repulsive, a deep-seated animosity, intense hatred, a repugnance, to find something objectionable, something that causes one to feel disgust or repulsion, a deep-seated aversion, this is not just a case of dislike. It is a case of actual hatred. Wow. So whatever the Nicolaitans were doing, the church of Ephesus was repulsed by it. They had an aversion to it. It put them off. It was just horrible, whatever the Nicolaitans were doing. There were deeds that hate us, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. This word deed, the Greek word erga, describes some kind of action, deed, or activity, a word so all-encompassing that it pictures actions, beliefs, and conduct. The total output of the Nicolaitans was negative, and the church of Ephesus hated it, hated it, hated it. They had an aversion toward it. And in fact, it was so terrible, Christ says, which I also hate. Christ was repulsed by the deeds and by the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Well, who in the world were the Nicolaitans then? And who are the Nicolaitans today? Wow, that's a very important question. Well, first of all, the word Nicolaitan is from the Greek word Nicolaus. It's a compound of two words, the word Nike, which means to conquer, and the word Laos, where we get the word for laity, 
and it describes the people. When you put the two words together, it forms a Greek word, nikoleos. Listen to this. It means to conquer and to subdue people. A proper Greek name that means one who conquers or subdues the laity. So whoever the Nicolaitans were, their teaching and their deeds was bringing some kind of a conquering, subjugating, defeating effect to the people of God. In fact, it was so negative. Christ says, I hate it, I hate it, I hate it. I'm repulsed by it. I'm put off by it. I have an aversion toward it. You have an aversion toward it. I also hate it. What do we know about the Nicolaitans? Well, we know that the Nicolaitans, whatever they were teaching, whatever they were doing, was conquering and subduing God's people. That was the end result of their deeds and their teaching. Early church fathers wrote, and I'm going to read to you, that the Nicolaitans were a heretical group that taught there was nothing wrong with serving Christ while simultaneously participating in pagan practices, or the Nicolaitans said, hey, let's compromise. Rather than live so separate from the world, rather than live lives that the world does not understand and puts us in posi opposition with society, let's learn to mitigate and navigate and compromise with the world. And in fact, they even taught that it was okay to serve Christ and go to the pagan temples and make sacrifices to the pagan gods at the same time if it will buy you a little peace with your neighbors. It was a doctrine of compromise, and Christ hated it. He especially hated it because it was appealing to younger Christians at that time because they were coming to Christ, and Christ called them to a life of separation. Their family members had not come to Christ. They were still pagans. They didn't understand what they were doing. It put them in opposition with their families. But the doctor of the Nicolaitans said, hey, you don't have to live a separate life. You can still act like a pagan, think like a pagan, embrace pagans. You don't have to live a separate life. You can compromise. And Christ said, I hate this doctrine of compromise. I hate it. I'm repulsed by it. Now listen, Christ had an extreme aversion to the activities of the Nicolaitans, an aversion so strong that the Greek word is translated to hate. Christ was disgusted, outraged, exasperated, and weary of them and their activities. What these leaders were endorsing was utterly objectionable to Jesus. Christ never said he hated them, but he hated their deeds and he hated their teachings. What he hated was their compromising teaching that caused believers to compromise with the world around them. Christ died for the Nicolaitans as much as he died for anybody else, and he loved them, but he hated what they represented, and he hated their detrimental influence inside the church. Now, that was then. How do we recognize Nicolaitanism in the modern church? Because let me tell you, it's alive and well. How do we recognize Nicolaitanism today? Today, there are spiritual leaders who, like the Nicolaitans of the past, seek a truce with a world under the guise, listen, under the guise of inclusiveness and compromise. Some of these leaders once held strong doctrinal positions, but over time they have reshaped their beliefs to match the changing moral climate of society, and in the process they have produced a gospel very different from the one presented in the Bible. So, what are the primary indicators of modern Nicolaitanism? And I'm going to give you four. There are many, but I'm going to give you four. Number one, no emphasis on holy living and separation from the world. No emphasis on holy living and separation from the world. Modern Nicolaitanism dresses itself in the guise of inclusiveness. Rather than living separate from the world, they infer that we need to accept and embrace everyone, inclusive of all, regardless of their lifestyle choices. Ultimately, it does away with the notion of sin and the need for repentance. For example, you may know some denominational churches that have taken the position that the time has come to help people of different sexual lifestyle choices that are different from the biblical view to blend into the church community to lead holy lives among the other members of the church. Wow. This is modern Nicolaitanism. Or how about number two? No emphasis on the doctrinal teaching of the Bible. Be very careful of this. Modern Nicolaitanism dresses itself in the guise of progressiveness. 
dismissing much of the Bible as being too restrictive or exclusive of other people's beliefs. Instead of being a guide to absolute truth, they use the Bible merely as a reference for illustrations, motivational sermons, inspirational ideas, or principles to build marriages or businesses, and on and on. They allege the Bible is never to be used to judge or to imply that anyone else is wrong for any reason. How in the world is that possible? This is so far off track. This trend is so rampant in the church today that the basic tenets of the Christian faith are largely not known by most churchgoers, especially by those who are younger. Basic Bible doctrines such as the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Christ, sin, salvation, holiness, eternal judgment, these are often unknown, inadequately taught, or even considered optional. Where modern Nicolaitanism prevails, doctrine is frequently replaced with social action, social justice, and an attempt to appeal to a mass audience by making people feel better about themselves. True doctrinal teaching of the Bible is diminished. It is replaced by different variants of watered down, politically correct instruction. Number three, Nicolaitanism has no emphasis on truth or absolute biblical authority. Modern Nicolaitanism dresses itself in the guise of being open-minded. It cries that it's unfair and unjust to assert that beliefs alone are the absolute foundation for truth. Even if we believe that we're right, it makes allowances that we may be wrong or that others may be equally right with a different approach. To demonstrate how deeply this damaging influence has already permeated the church, it is a statistical fact that more than half of evangelical Christians do not believe in absolute truth. To understand where this trend is headed, just hold an honest conversation with people under the age of 25. And you will learn firsthand that even many young Christian men and women hold a negative view of people who adhere to absolute truth or absolute biblical authority. It's amazing. Or how about number four? Wow, this one's really important. No exclusionary belief that Christ alone is the way to heaven. Modern Nicolaitanism dresses itself in the guise of tolerance, asserting that everyone has a piece of the truth. It actually levels the playing field and makes Christianity simply a truth among other truths. If Nicolaitanism is followed to its logical conclusion, it eventually leads to universalism, which is the belief that everyone and everything, including the devil himself, will ultimately be reconciled to God. It teaches there are many roads leading to the same eventual destination and that every person should be able to find his own way. According to this mindset, to declare that Christ alone is the way to heaven is simply intolerance, it is unintelligent, it is nonsense. Wow, this is amazing. Now the truth is there are many indicators of Nicolaitanism. But if this is embraced, what I'm telling you, it produces, listen, a powerless, weakened version of Christianity where sin is tolerated, separation is ignored, and the need for repentance is disregarded. And that explains why Christ hated the deeds and the teaching of the Nicolaitans and why he commended the Ephesian church for also hating it. This is something we need to have a repulsion toward. It is wrong. It is destructive. It saps the power of the Spirit from the church. We are called to live separate holy lives that are based on the absolute authority of Scripture. We're out of time, but I'll be back in just a moment, and I'm going to pray for you. The Bible comes to life like never before with Rick Renner's book, A Light in Darkness. Step into the world of the New Testament as Rick Renner transports you to the ancient cities of the early church, revealing the relevance of Jesus' messages to the church then and why those messages still resonate for his church today. With unsurpassed detail, fascinating insights, and historical context, you'll have a greater appreciation and understanding of Scripture and how you should interpret it for today. This beautifully bound 800-page book, available for just $70 when you call or go online today. You can also get Christ's message to Ephesus, 
an in-depth 10-part teaching series that delves deep into the message Jesus gave to the Ephesian church, available in physical and digital formats, starting at just $20. Rick uses this teaching series to remind you to return to your first love of Jesus, a light in darkness, and Christ's message to Ephesus. Call now, 1-800-742-5593, or go to renner.org to order. My name is Joel Renner, coming to you from Moscow, Russia, and I want to say thank you to all of our ministry partners. You are helping us help the homeless people of our city. There are countless numbers of homeless people in the world. Life and wrong decisions for many have dealt them a bad hand. Often before we can share Christ with people, we have to meet their basic needs. So that's what we do. Because of your giving, we have created an opportunity in Moscow for the homeless to receive help and care several times a week. Your gifts have allowed us to provide hot meals, clothing, and medical attention to the homeless of our city. Then we share Christ with them. Will you consider joining us as a partner today? There are so many more homeless people that are struggling in the cold, hungry, and desperate for help. Your gifts will allow us to continue reaching the homeless in our city. When you give, you are able to bring the gospel of Christ to the homeless and to the ends of the earth. Please call 1-800-742-5593 or go online to renner.org. Because of your gift of any size, we can continue to make this huge difference in people's lives. After Jesus is finished addressing the issue of Nicolaitanism in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6, he follows up in verse 7 by saying, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. That's interesting because it means everyone does not have an ear to hear. Jesus is speaking to people who have an ear to hear what he has been saying. Do you have an ear to hear? Christ is speaking to those who are receptive, to those who really have an ear to hear. And listen to what he says next. To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. This is God's call to every single Christian. You're called to overcome. That word overcome is the Greek word nikau. Listen to what it means. It describes a victor, a champion, or one who possesses superiority. It can be translated to conquer, to defeat, to master, to overcome, to overwhelm, to surpass, or to be victorious. That is God's call to every single believer. You're to conquer yourself. You're to conquer your backward ways. You're to conquer your environment, conquer the devil, conquer negativism, conquer false doctrine, conquer everything that Christ has addressed in all of these verses. You're called to be the master. In fact, you're called to be a walloping, overwhelming force. And to the one who overcomes, and by the way, the Greek says, not just overcome in the past, but the one who is in the process of continually overcoming, you start overcoming, you're all the time overcoming for the rest of your life, you're occupied with being an overcomer. To the one who is continually overcoming, Jesus offers all kinds of marvelous rewards. I want to pray for you. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus for my dear friend to overcome everything they're facing in life. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit to help them do that in Jesus' name. Thanks for being with me. Remember Ecclesiastes 8.4, where the word of a king is, there's power. Let God's word release its power in your life today, and I'll see you in the next program.